Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. If your child struggles with attention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, or other symptoms of ADHD, it can be challenging to know just how to help them. Increasing meltdowns and defiance, having a hard time at school, difficulty with organization, following through on tasks, or remembering what to do are all early warning signs that something is wrong. Welcome to Behavior Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor, and my guest today, Dr. Connie McReynolds, is going to help us more clearly understand what may be occurring in your child's brain and will provide us with research-based solutions to address a child's struggles. Connie is a seasoned professional with 30 plus years in rehabilitation counseling and psychology, holding licenses as a psychologist, certified rehabilitation counselor, and certified vocational evaluator. As a visionary founder of the Neurofeedback Clinics in Southern California, she specializes in transforming the lives of individuals aged 5 to 90 by addressing conditions like ADHD, anxiety, anger, depression, chronic pain, learning problems, and trauma. An acclaimed author of Solving the ADHD Riddle, she is a number one bestseller author on Amazon. Connie is also a sought-after speaker and hosts the podcast Roadmap to Your Brain, offering valuable insights and guidance for healing and improving the quality of life. We're excited to have Connie with us today to discuss ADHD and her book, Solving the ADHD Riddle, The Real Cause and Lasting Solutions to Your Child's Struggle to Learn. Connie, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. It is really nice to have you. You know, I would love our listeners as we start out today just to get an understanding of you and your professional life and specifically what drew you to your work with children and adults diagnosed with ADHD. Well, you know, as most journeys go, it goes back to our own roots, influences from childhood and such. And my mother taught second grade for 32 years in the same classroom. Uh, So she started when I started kindergarten, (laughs) which was a day or two ago. And I also often joke that I I actually grew up in second grade because obviously I was, you know, in every classroom when when she was all the children. And I learned how to grade papers (laughs) early on to assist her in the evenings with all the work. And then also the stories of the children. And Mm. in the book was this compelling story in the beginning, really about As I was writing this book, this story came back to me of this little boy who couldn't learn how to read. And uh, it turns out that he had something at that time that wasn't very well known, which was dyslexia. And by going to a university teaching center, she was able to work with those folks to find ways to help him. And she did this over the summer. So this wasn't part of her regular job. She wasn't paid for that. And she was driving him and me and my little brother up and back Is that right? <laughs> 45 Isn't miles nice? every one. And then my aunt was a professor and dean of a college of education. And uncle was a professor. So kind of come from a long line of that world. And then I've been a counselor for over 30 years and, so, and a psychologist. And when I moved to Southern California, I was afforded this amazing opportunity when they recruited me out here to build a center. And I had no idea what that was going to be, but as things go, things evolved, things showed up and I learned about neurofeedback. A colleague was using it in another County, helping children learn how to read. (laughs) And it's like, oh my goodness, is there something we really can do here? And so it evolved from that. It's kind of the thumbnail sketch of it. Obviously there's a little bit more in there, but that's really kind of how everything started. Yeah. I love that. I love, you know, we, children experience so many things and they don't know what they don't know about what they're experiencing at times. All they know is that they're experiencing challenges that maybe they can't explain. And historically it was hard to explain some of those things is maybe we hadn't understood whether it's the dyslexia or we're going to be talking about today, ADHD, and it would be so difficult for them. And in that process, they'd be so easily misunderstood and oftentimes disciplined or scolded for wrong things and all kinds of things just begin to deteriorate from there. But we're talking today about a couple of things. One, you mentioned neurofeedback and also within the context of treating ADHD. And I want to shift just a wee bit to have you enable our listeners to have a better definition of ADHD. Help us understand the definition and then maybe it's increasing diagnosis as we're seeing from professionals. Well, it really is a situation that is going on. And so I always like to start with just spelling out the word ADHD for those who 
who may not know what this means, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. You know, there's kind of a push pull with that because a lot of parents will say, well, my child isn't hyperactive. There's, you know, this can't be this. And so they just kind of automatically push back and they understand the pushback. Some parents don't want their children to have that label that kind of follows them through the school system. There's a lot that's packed in to some of these diagnostic labels. And it's really the challenge that I present in the world, which is and has always been in my world, labels don't really do much to tell us what to do to help someone when we're in this side of a diagnostic criteria. Diagnosis for broken bone, an organ that isn't working, is a little more clean cut. The whole DSM process is a little gray in there. It's a little bit harder to necessarily understand what's going on. And the DSM is really just a clustering of symptoms. And so under each one of those categories, you can have a long list. And when the DSM was revised um, sometime back, uh, this whole ADHD definition was expanded to where it almost became a concept that almost anyone could qualify for a diagnosis of ADHD. And so, yes, there's an uptick. Is it because of the diagnostic criteria being a little looser now? Well, it's probably a factor. Mm. Is it that we may be a little more aware of children who are struggling? Well, that could be a factor. Mm. Is it also a possibility that we want all the children to kind of fit in a certain box and look a certain way in a classroom and someone who does it then gets put into a category? Well, that is a, cat that is a problem too. Mm. Uh, are there other environmental factors that could be contributing to a child's distractibility? Well, I think we know the answer to that is yes. <laughs> so when you look at all of those things up above, the answer is yes to all of that. And it all of those things are factors as to why we have this much ADHD. I think in some ways we are a little more sensitive to what children's needs are than maybe what was happening years ago. But I go back to my mother's classroom when she had 20 or 22 children back in the day. And I'll date it back <laughs> in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> um, she might have one child who was having difficulty. And I remember one time she would talk about this one little boy. She said she'd look up and he'd be, you know, sitting on top of his desk. He would be, uh, next time she looked up, he'd be under the desk. Next time she looked up, he'd be standing beside his desk. He could not sit still. And so for a teacher who may have five or six of these kiddos in her classroom or his classroom, that can be a very distracting situation. So I completely understand the classroom. I've been in the classroom myself for 25 years. Uh, so I know kind of how these things go. And I watched my mom for 32 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not foreign to what happens in classrooms. But I do think we need a deeper conversation, which is where I think we're going today. <laughs> we are going there today. What I'm appreciating is just that right out of the gate. The idea is that maybe we can understand things in a new way by watching a cluster of certain signs and symptoms that mm -hmm. might be kind of outside, if we could say, the realm of normal, whatever that's going to be. But just bear with me for a second, mm -hmm. that somehow we got, you know, 21 kids in the classroom that are kind of kind of being focused and kind of sitting in their desk. We got this one child over here that's on top and around and in the you know broom closet and everywhere else. But it's also a child, too, that, you know, it doesn't have necessarily have to have the H in it as well. It doesn't have to have the hyperactive piece to it. It can just have a child in their seat and maybe is looking outside or can't seem to focus or can't remember to follow some instructions that you gave them that are two or three steps instructions. And and so there's there's the the piece just where there's the, the attention deficit, you know, disorder there without the hyperactive piece right there. It doesn't always need that piece. And as you talk about this cluster of things, how, how might we help our audience understand what are some of the best signs to maybe understand and maybe kind of rule in a diagnosis of ADD, ADHD? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the keys are always sitting right in the behaviors that are happening in front of us. And part of the challenge in our kind of Western approach to things is we have a little bit of a, a Band-Aid approach. So mm -hmm. let's get rid of the behaviors and then everything will be okay. Well, I understand from a teacher's standpoint, we need to tackle those behaviors because they could be interrupting the ability of other children to learn. Before we jump too far down that rabbit hole, though, what are those behaviors actually saying to us? Because those behaviors are a language 
and this is the only language this child has to tell people around him or her that they're struggling. That's good. And so if we can step back for a moment and take time, if teachers can take time, if parents can take a little bit of time too, instead of immediately perceiving this child as engaging in willful bad behavior, which leads to interventions and punishments and medications and such immediately in a lot of cases, if we can pull back on that immediate kind of knee-jerk reaction on this and look at what this is saying. So for example, and I've broken this out in my book, there's a chapter on auditory, there's a chapter on visual. Yeah. Because for children who have auditory processing, by the way, there's 37 measures <laughs> that we're looking at. So it's not just one thing. We have a lot that we look at in these assessments to really hone in on the very specific areas that are working in those areas that aren't. So I'll take one that people kind of resonate with. So it's called auditory sequential memory. And so if I give you a list of things verbally, four or five things I want you to go do, mm -hmm. and consistently none of that happens or only one thing happens, and maybe there was a dog mentioned in there, and that's the only thing that, <laughs> that pops up is like, oh, I get to go play with the dog, instead of really it was like feed the dog. <laughs> It was, you know, uh, go change the litter box or, you know, whatever it might be. Go pick up your shoes, get those toys picked up. And the only thing that happened was I'm playing with the dog. Right. <laughs> so clear indication here that there's some auditory processing thing going on. A one-off note. Consistently, day in and day out. Classroom, not following instructions. This is the kid that might be, as you were mentioning, kind of staring off into space, drifting out. The hyperactivity piece is a lot easier to find. The inattentive piece is a little harder for people to hone in on. So that inattentive piece is the place where a lot of children, and that's where kind of this, and even with the hyperactivity, if you tell a child who has this to sit still, they can't sit still. No. It doesn't matter how many times you tell them or how much. And this is the other key. If all the interventions have not resulted in lost, lasting long-term change, then something else has to be done. There's something right. else going on here. It's not just purely a behavioral problem. Yeah. So for Go. visual processing, ones that can show up for this that people don't really think about too much is, um, let's say you say, go pick up your toys and it never happens. Clean up the room. It never happens. The backpack, you look in there, it looks like something, <laughs> something really bad oh, happened in there. Right. <laughs> you know, it's not looking very good in there. The homework you worked on till midnight last night never makes it to school. It's lost between the time right. you close the backpack and by the time the child gets to school the next day, mm -hmm. it's disappeared. They have no idea where it is. Keys are lost, shoes are lost, yes. phones are lost, backpacks are lost. Oh, yeah. These are signs of visual processing problems. And this is one of the areas that I think is much less discussed because it seems like it's easier to hone in on children of the auditory because they're perceived as just willfully not paying attention. But this child with visual, another cue could be, is this the child that kind of trips over everything, bumps into mm -hmm. things, knocks things over, just looks really clumsy. Sometimes mm -hmm. so that could be visual. And when I'm talking about this, I'm assuming or presuming that the vision and the auditory have already been checked and that they're working okay. So those pieces would already have been ruled out uh, by the time we're really assessing the rest of this. There are so many important pieces of what you just said. I want to go back to something just I, I really like. You said the behaviors that a child is exhibiting, that's their best language. And they require us as parents, teachers, others, to be able to interpret for them something that they can't put words to. Mm -hmm. And if we don't understand it, we mislabel it through kind of a scolding lens of them not being enough. I talked to somebody earlier today about this and just feeling like they could just not get it right ever. And then what happens on not, not uncharacteristically is they begin to personalize this because that's what children do. This is who I am, not what's mm -hmm. happening to me or how you know I am uniquely designed here that I need to have understood. And so these behaviors, I love what you're saying. It's their best language. Then you're also talking about, there are some ways that we can band-aid this, you know, to get rid of the behaviors, but you're talking about something deeper at an auditory 
and at a visual level that is actually going on in our brain. And I would like to kind of shift into that because what you're saying with that is this is where we can get down to the real root cause of what's going on and not just band-aid it, but to understand how we can maybe resolve this in a really solution-based way with some permanency. Mm-hmm. Can you begin to shift for us? You know, I, I know you're excited to share. I'm excited to hear about what the real root cause <laughs> is. And, you know, a child's brain having these auditory and, and, and visual processing shortcomings. So what is the difference between maybe a traditional ADHD explanation and what maybe you know and are advocating for as a mm-hmm. viable causative explanation and the treatment pro- protocol around this using the, the uh, neurofeedback? Mm-hmm. So the traditional approaches were really what I was just kind of yeah, exactly. leaning into a little bit, which is, you know, we try to get rid of the behaviors before we really know what they are. This approach is really trying to understand the behaviors and then work from there. So we use this information that we gather. So the assessment that I use has been out for you know, a decade or two, probably more than that by now. And it's a, an amazing tool because it's computer-based and it takes about 20 minutes mm. to get a 15-page report. I do see there are some school systems that can't believe that we can get that in that period of time. Minutes, <laughs> yes, because they're accustomed to using days of testing. Right. And what we can get to actually is far more useful, in my opinion, and in the opinion of the school psychologists that I have worked with, who are saying, you know, this is very useful. And we piloted it with teachers and administrators in an elementary school, and they found it very useful. So the difference that I'm looking at here is really uncovering what I call the root cause of what's happening with children in their brain. It's processing. So an example of what this can be, and I always like to bring this in, is that there can be testing that shows a child is cognitively delayed. So let's say that this child actually has auditory and visual processing problems. They can't track on what they're supposed to do when they take an assessment or visually, they're not tracking on how they're supposed to even fill in a form or do something on a computer. They're not tracking. All we're doing with some of these assessments, in my opinion, is a measuring their ability to take the test. <laughs> and if they can't pass taking the test, then the results of that, in my mind, are a little bit questionable because we don't know if it's just the test-taking behavior that's interfering with their ability to do well on that assessment, or are we actually getting data that is talking about what they're capable of doing? Yeah, very good. And so that's a distinction I am not seeing in very many places. And the one that I came to understand was probably the most critical thing we could be doing to help these children. So when we dial in on these 37 areas, I can tell processing speed, let's go there. So we measure visual processing speed and auditory processing speed. And within that, if this child and I will say adults fit in this category exactly the same. The book is obviously written for parents and teachers and adults, but I've had many adults read this and find themselves in the book and say, oh my gosh, I need help. (laughs) This is what's going on for me. And I've worked with as many adults with ADHD as I have children. So the processing speed piece is if I have slow processing speed, imagine that I have a really good brain, but I'm only operating in first or second gear. Right. And so everything coming at me, I'm in slow motion compared to the speed with which the information is being delivered in a classroom. Mm -hmm. I can't keep up. What do I look like? I look like a, quote, slow learner. How is, quote, slow learner interpreted? In most conditions and situations, it's deemed to be intellectual cognitive delays. Yes. And what I found is that we can have brilliant and genius children come into my clinics who have been in special education their entire life because of processing speed. Yeah. Yeah. So when we dial in on these 37 areas, we're able to clearly find those areas that need training. And so the brain training that we do is EEG biofeedback. Mm-hmm. Just if I can clarify something real quick, are those 37 areas you're looking at, is that kind of in the prefrontal cortex area? Here, it, it, it's not necessarily limited to just that. Because the brain is such an integrated unit. There's 
There are some areas, if it's occipital, there could be something going on in the occipital lobe that could okay, be for the visual case. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So mm-hmm. we use what's called the 1020 map of the brain. So uh, that's standardized in the industry. So that's okay. been figured out eons ago. And placements of sensors and such, that's figured out. So we just have to understand where to go. <laughs> so we're going and to go so into the neurofeedback right here. But what you're doing with this kind of mapping almost with the 37 different areas, it's beginning to outline for you where you're going to set up these electrodes, which we'll talk about those in a minute, mm-hmm. that are going to affect very specifically and very directly the areas that you're finding from this assessment. 20 minutes, 15 page report that is really a clear, clear picture of here's where we need to go, here's where we get to focus, and we get to do something about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the good news about the system that we're using is that we can also treat anxiety, panic disorder, trauma, all mm-hmm. of that concurrently. So yeah. we can just kind of figure out where we need to go with some of these aspects. And we don't use the big caps that a lot of folks use. There's reasons to use different approaches. We really go at it in a way where we're kind of tackling one thing at a time. And I had spoken to someone in a well-known clinic out here in Southern California that did have a neurofeedback center. They closed it down years ago. And she was telling me, and again, this is just my understanding from her. She ran that clinic. Uh, They were using something around 19 sensors. And so the problem that they had is they weren't sure what results they were getting from what, because it was kind of a global approach. Now, there may be reasons why someone would do that. Ours is a little different approach, and everyone has a reason for why you know they use the systems that they do. Ours, I think, works for the work that I'm doing, which is really tackling these auditory and visual processing problems, and then anything that comes along with that, which can be the trauma, the anxiety, and, and the like. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Are you preparing for a licensure exam in psychology, social work, marriage and family therapy, counseling, or behavioral analysis? AATBS is here to help. We have been supporting behavioral and mental health students to prepare for their licensure exams for more than 45 years, working with over 1 million students to succeed on test day and move on to the next step in their career. With products ranging from comprehensive courses to quiz banks and delivered live online, self-study online, and in print, AATBS has test prep solutions that meet every student's needs and learning styles. Visit us today at aatbs.com. That's aatbs.com. And use promo code BHT15 to save 15% off your next purchase. As we move into the treatment piece of this right here, And we're looking at the auditory, the visual processing of these things that you get to measure very specifically. As we segue into this, talk to us a little bit about what neurofeedback is. Use a protocol with this. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But what is neurofeedback for our listeners? Mm -hmm. Neurofeedback is kind of the second generation to biofeedback. And in many cases, it it is referred to as EEG biofeedback. And that really is what it is. So EEG stands for electroencephalogram, which is why we call it EEG, (laughs) because no one wants to walk around saying that word all day long. (laughs) So we call it EEG biofeedback. And most people have some familiarity with biofeedback, which is in the beginning when this kind of came about, you might use a sensor to measure your pulse on your finger. Maybe it's measuring your respiration. And by getting feedback through this unit, you could see that if you relaxed your muscles, you were taking deeper breaths, you were calming yourself down, that had a direct impact on your biological information that was being gathered, Uh, hence the word biofeedback. So neurofeedback, neuro just has to do with the brain. So it's the same concept. We're reading information from the brain. And I always like to say nothing is going into your brain with our system. There are other situations and treatments that maybe do administer some things, but within the industry, there's kind of a belief that if it's true neurofeedback, it's not anything that's being administered to your brain. So there it's very other... similar to when you, you know, you go for maybe for an EKG, you have those sensors put yes. on your heart or on your chest, or you exactly take your temperature, you know, and, mm-hmm. and these are just on the skin. Nothing, nothing is penetrating right. or going on on the inside. It just measures right. what's going on, on the inside in some inside very accurate brain. ways. Yeah. <laughs> it's measuring brain waves and it's feeding this yep. into the computer 
And with that data, then you get that data. You're looking at this information in our particular way. We actually have training programs that look a little bit like video games. And so if you're manufacturing the brainwave that we're going after, so if it's attention and you're paying attention to your program, then your brain's going to create that and your brain will actually learn how to strengthen itself. So yeah. the brain, that's the key here, is the brain is learning how to strengthen itself through repetition. And that's how the brain learns and hangs on to everything. So repetition. you've identified the areas of weakness. If we looked at a bodybuilder, we might say, well, hey, you know what? Your calves need to get a little stronger. Exactly. Or maybe your biceps need to get a little bit bigger. So you're going to do you know, toe-ups and you're going to do bicep curls <laughs> to strengthen those areas to round out a very effective body, in this case, if you will, as an athlete, let's say. And what you're saying, there are just parts of the brain that we can now measure very specifically to say, hey, this is just an under-functioning area. And we can begin to strengthen that kind of like building a, a brain muscle area that can really assist with increasing the auditory piece, increasing the visual piece. Mm -hmm. And it, it involves kind of a, a child going through, or an adult too, going through what kind of protocol? What do they do as they're strengthening mm -hmm. these areas? What's happening? Sure. Well, let's just say we're tackling both auditory and visual. So okay. the training program would be 30 minutes and usually two or three times a week. We okay. do 20 of those, which equals 10 hours of training. And then we come back and we reassess. So the baselines happen at the intake. Uh, when I meet with the people, we administer these assessments. And then after the 10 hours of training or 20 sessions, we come back, reassess and look at the progress that has been gained. The training plan is really consisting of two to three minute programs that are built together like you could go to the gym. So if you go to the gym, you build a training plan. This is the same thing. It's a training plan for your brain. And so by doing the same training plan 20 times, then we find that that wires in and strengthens those neuronal pathways. And the good news about this system <laughs> is that you don't have to keep coming back to the gym once you get this trained up. And so the good news here, unlike the gym that we go to physically, we always have to keep going or doing something there. With this, once the neuronal pathways are strengthened, they tend to hold. And the case in point is, you can probably remember back to childhood learning how to ride a bike. You might not have been on a bike for a long time, but you probably can get back on the bike and figure out how to ride it. Yeah. And the same with a bad habit. So you can think about a bad habit you want to change. How hard is that to necessarily change that? Well, you have to wire in something different, but it shows you the wiring can hold. That's really great. So we got we got 30 minute sessions, two or three times a week, and we're looking at 20 and then there's a reassessment of things. And there's something here that's kind of unique. So if I go to the gym, I, I build muscle, but if I don't, I atrophy because it's just how our body works. But you're saying with the neural pathways that are being strengthened, these stick. When you first do the measurement with the assessment that you have, are you able to see post-treatment, putting on the same you know, measures for electrodes to measure, are you seeing those areas that were once weak now up to where you want them to be in their terms of their production, both auditorily and visually? Mm -hmm. So the computer-based assessment is looking at those 37 areas and we track yeah. that, evidence-based. Yeah. But then also within the system, when we're measuring the brain waves, which is also a piece, an important piece, that we're measuring those brain waves. And as the brain gets stronger, these programs get tougher. So you're building muscle mass, if you wish, you brain yes. training. I hate to use that because someone could jump all over there. You're not changing the brain mass of your, you know, mass of your brain, but you're changing the neuronal pathway strengths. Yeah. And in some cases, children and adults don't have any processing in some of these areas. And so when you don't have any we're going to need a little bit more probably in, than the typical where we're having to necessarily kind of build some of those neuronal pathways, and that can take a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. So for children who really are found to not have any visual processing, that can take a little bit. You know, we might be into 30 hours of training, but we've always been able to get that to come on on the children that we've worked with and adults. Well, the key thing you're talking about here, which is, you know, the the whole emphasis of your book and, and your approach is... We're going to get down to the root cause and we're going to correct it. We're going to build up those areas that stick, the neural pathways. We're not making one's brain bigger. So I don't want to use the analogy of weightlifting to say, hey, I'm going to have a bigger head. You know, I'm not going to become encephalopic, you know, in my, in my brain here. But my, my, but my neural pathways are going to be strengthened. And the communication, mm -hmm. neural pathways are, are just conduits for communication. 
and for the attention that we need to give to certain areas to be successful in life. I need to be able to do the four things you told me, not just go play with the dog. Right. I need to be able to turn that assignment in that I did, but I got to put it in my backpack, got to get my backpack in the car, and I got to put it in my back and take to the to the to the classroom and then put it on the teacher's desk. I don't need to be yes. able to do these things, mm -hmm. be successful both in the classroom and in life. Mm -hmm. And if I don't do that, I'm gonna come into marriage and my wife's gonna say, Can you take out the trash and you know, feed the children and I'm going to go play with the dog and I'm going to mm. miss some things here that really become problematic. Once we strengthen these areas, this is a, uh, we, we might say a, a permanent fix. These neural pathways, they strengthen, they stay strengthened. And we can even measure that. You're saying with a pre-post, we've got the pre-measures with the computers that with the under-functioning, and then we can do a post mm -hmm. and show the areas that were once dark, let's say, not not firing. Now we get to see them kind of being alive and firing. Is that correct? That is correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't have the visual of the brain. We have the assessment results. Correct. And yes. So, yes. And so, if it was zero and it's now near one hundred, well, that's pretty good data. Yeah. And you really, you know, and that's that's a good visual for people to hang on to as well, is they get to see this, they feel it, and I'll say that part of the ongoing assessment process is more than just data on a sheet. Or taking an assessment, I'm looking at does this translate or what we call generalize into a person's life, day-to-day -day life. So we're always asking questions, you know, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? What are you noticing, if anything? And there are times I had one little boy we'd been working with early on and he had inattentiveness and he came in and his parents were behind him that day and he's kind of long in the face. <laughs> and so well, what's going on? He goes, well, it's working. He said, I can pay attention even when I don't want to now. <laughs> I no longer have an excuse. Huh? I can pay attention now. It's working. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that's a fun story. Uh, that's funny. I was, oh my I reading, gosh. I love that. I was reading one of your uh, testimonials on your site. And I'm going to paraphrase a little wee bit. And it, it, it's something along the lines of, you didn't give me back my life. I think the person said, I, I never really had a life. I had a life of chaos. And you gave me something here I've reclaimed kind of kind of how it's supposed to be yeah. and how it gets to be in my life at this point. And with these neural pathways strengthened and my ability to attend. And so let, let's talk a little bit about what are you seeing being some of the takeaways with folks that are now able with increased auditory, with increased visual processing and the neural pathways being strengthened in a permanent way. What is their life looking like now? Like that. A person mentioned, and yeah. we've just collected those kinds of testimonials yeah, for years one. now. A young boy, a teenager who couldn't pass his driver's test, taking it. Oh, six yeah. Times. Yes. <laughs> couldn't pass it. The dad goes, we are just up against a rock here. We don't know what to do. Not that the boy was a rock, but they didn't know what to do. He came in and, and we did the neurofeedback with him. He went back and took it and he passed. You know, yeah. things like that. I've had adults. One gentleman sticks in mind, particularly, he was in his 50s. He found me somehow. He came in and he was telling me the story that he was getting ready to get fired yet again. He'd lost so many jobs over the years because yeah. what he realized, he started to realize is he just couldn't remember what people were telling him to do. And his boss was telling him he couldn't remember it. And so we did the assessment. And lo and behold, this, this gentleman really didn't have much of any auditory processing or memory. And so I showed him these results and he broke down in my conference oh. room because he said for the first time in his life, he didn't think maybe it was because he was stupid. Well, you gave him some hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's not, maybe it's not about you. It's what's going on within you, but it's not about you. It's, it's so easily personalized, isn't it? And it starts, it starts in elementary school yeah. where children are seeing someone else able to do something they can't, oh, they yeah. don't know why they can't do it. The teacher's yeah. frustrated because they're not following through. Parents are frustrated. So the immediate thing these children do is internalize this is that there's something wrong with them. You bet. And the and only we, place they have to go is to say, I must not be very smart. Yeah. What's really hard about that is that, and, and there's a little bit of a gender difference around this, and you probably speak to it probably more deeply than I can, but I, well, I, I, I see those with ADHD in, in girls, it gets internalized in, in, in a very, you know, women tend to get more depressed and men act out. So with a, in this kind of a case here, we see that, you know, little girls begin to think maybe I'm not good enough. I'm, you know, I'm lacking. There's something fundamentally wrong with me. Boys can think the same thing and girls kind of go within. Boys, oftentimes you'll see acted out and you'll see our prison system. There's a lot of ADHD in that rule breaking, you know, risk taking those kinds of things that occur. These are the things that occur kind of even gender wise. 
You know, as you're talking here, and I'm thinking about um, one thing, let me ask a quick question. Is there ever a need for like a little bit of a booster type thing? Does that ever happen? Someone says, I want a little bit of a, you know, increase even more, a little bit of a booster. Is that ever necessary? Or those ones, again, once strengthened, strengthened? So for most people, they don't need to come back for a booster. I mean, that's really uh, the key to this. Now, on occasion, I've had someone come back, but this person had a car accident. So mm. they came back after a car accident. They'd noticed their brain functioning had changed. And so we'd have the pre-accident intervention. So what the person was like before the intervention and after, and then they came back after the car accident. And in fact, it was different. What we needed to tackle was a different set of conditions that had shown up now in that person's brain processing. So we were able to tackle that. Most people that we've worked with that I've heard from, and some have called back years later yeah. and have said, you know, I just want you to know this just keeps getting better. And one woman, I think we may have a testimonial somewhere on her as well uh, that's up there. She, she told me that she was now back to the functioning brain function she had when she was 19 years old, when she worked for a famous laboratory out here in Southern California, and she was the youngest person that had ever been hired into this particular laboratory. But over the years, she, because of trauma and a number of things that had happened for her, she really had lost a lot of cognitive functioning. Yeah. And she said now she's back to where she can, you know, serve on these major committees and yeah. deal with environmental conditions and the like. And she, she says she's got it back now. It's like, man, that's so good. <laughs> yeah. That, it doesn't get any better than that. That, 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 that kind of wakes us up in the morning to go to work, doesn't it? You know, this, what you're raising right here, maybe a little deviation from the ADHD, but trauma changes the brain and it when does. we go through these things and it affects our functioning. And if mm -hmm. we can use the narrow feedback, like you're describing here to help other, you know, situations and presenting problems, boy, yes. what a, what a, what a gift to people. You know, as I'm thinking about this ability to use some pre-post measures that are computer-driven and computer-based, you can see the numbers right there. It is ripe for some cool research. What are you putting together through your neurofeedback clinics that be able to that's, that's able to kind of hold up? Guys, look at this. Mm -hmm. This is working, and here's the numbers to prove it. What are you doing research-based wise in terms of your success rate? Sure. So I actually published back in 2017 in the International Journal on our work with veterans because I had a particular interest in that during my doc program many years ago, I actually worked at the VA in Wisconsin okay. and I was on the chemical dependency treatment unit. I ran anger management programs for these veterans who were court ordered in, you know, lots and lots of trauma. And at that time we were still really dealing with a lot of the folks that had come out of Vietnam. So it was some pretty hardwired stuff in these yes. folks. And out here, when I set up the initial pilot project for the first year of this, I had two groups in mind. One was children with ADHD and one was veterans. So I just opened it up to the community and I said, we have this new program. We really want to get our feet on the ground with this. You know, if you know someone, just send them in. And I then it was fortunate enough that we had some veterans that took a lot of interest in what we were doing. And one of them helped me secure some funding from a local group where we were able to work with 30 veterans across the region. And we gathered data. So part of it obviously was the auditory and the visual, but part of it was their general well-being. And we showed significant improvement across the general well-being in that group of veterans. And with children then, we looked at the children and there were, I mean, there were some cutoffs. They had to have participated in the treatment protocols in the manner in which you know, we had set them up. So people deviated from that, didn't come in regularly. And, you know, they weren't included in this particular group. We wanted to look at the ones who just followed the protocol the way we had set it up. And I published that article in 2018 as well in an international journal. And those are up on my website. People can access those if they have interest in that. I've published a lot of other materials, but really moving into this, I wanted to put the rest of my efforts into the book at this time yeah. <laughs> because that. Uh, I really wanted this to be something that could get out to the public. The research pieces are usually buried in professional journals and they don't necessarily get out to the larger audience. And really the book is targeted for parents and adults and for people who really want to learn more about what this is that I've uncovered and the processes that we use. Really good. You know, I, when when people hear this, they might go back to what they've always known that 
well, what if we use like a Concerta or Adderall or Ritalin to be able to treat these things? And those have some effect. What I'm hearing you say, though, that could be a Band-Aid approach to something that we can actually permanently bring some change to, mm-hmm. areas to strengthen the neural pathways that someone has consistently throughout their life. It's, it's, it's a sustainable treatment that allows them to go into life. And it sounds like in some ways kind of continue to expand and grow in those areas. And you're saying, I've got some before and after data with computer-based you know, uh, assessments that give us the proof that in terms of the ADHD and the auditory visual function, these places, 37 areas that we can assess, there are significant changes occurring mm-hmm. that allow folks to have a long-term solution not just a Band-Aid, but a long-term solution that allows them to really experience what their true potential really gets to be and what they've been created to be able to experience in terms of their gifts and their abilities and talents and skills that get interfered and in, in, in minimized at times because of the auditory, in this case, and the visual, like a performance that keeps mm-hmm. them from being really seen for really who they are. This is a wonderful message. I know we're, I know we're kind of winding down in our time. I think you and I could keep talking for a while, but for today's show, if I could, I would love for you to give kind of a closing message of hope to mm-hmm. parents and teachers and those with ADHD that's struggling with this and mm-hmm. the treatment options available like you're talking about and how you'd like them to think about it. Mm-hmm. Well, it really is. The entire reason for writing this book has been to create a message of hope for people that if these other interventions, so in some cases, the behavioral interventions may be working okay. In some cases, the medications might be a good fit. Uh, This is for those that either don't want to go down that route or have tried all of those and it didn't end up with lasting solutions. And this is an opportunity to rethink how you're considering what this is. And part of this is really the reason is to change the narrative around this, that there are only these certain ways that we can tackle something. If we have learned anything in the last five years is that we have to start thinking outside the box more. We can't just go down the tried and true way and think that everything that we've done before is the only way we can do it today. Mm -hmm. It isn't. I've always probably been considered an outside the box (laughs) person. I think my mother was a little bit outside the box as well. She was too. I think she was too. (laughs) As they say, the fruit doesn't (laughs) fall too far from the tree. (laughs) in that one. So this really is that there's another narrative. And I really want this narrative to cover the globe in opening people's eyes for those folks who are struggling, the adults and the children, people struggling with trauma, people struggling with anxiety, depression, which we know has had a huge uptick in the last four years because of what we've gone through globally There's long-term consequences of this. And we've actually been treating some of the outcome from all of that for some people as well. There's a different way of thinking. There's a different way of going through this. And, you know, for those that this fits, it's a really good fit. And Yeah, it sounds like it really is. Yeah, what a great message. Yep, (laughs) I appreciate that. Well, with that message, I would love folks listening in today to learn more about you and to learn more about your book. How can they do so? Mm-hmm. Um, my website, ConnieMcReynolds.com, is a great place to start. There is actually a free brief assessment right there on the front page there you go. <laughs> that if people want to just dip their toe into this, it's like, okay, do I need to delve deeper? You can do the free brief assessment. And then if they want to go a little deeper, the book link is right there. So the book is usually available on most online booksellers platform, Solving the ADHD Riddle. There's a link straight to Amazon there. If you want to just make it simple, you can do that. And in the book, I have two chapters, one on auditory processing and one on visual processing that have checklists. At the end of those, that could be informative for people to try and figure out, okay, do I or does my child fall into one or the other of these? There can also be combined of both of those. And then in the book are teaching tips for children Mm -hmm. for auditory or for visual. There's parents tips for children with auditory and for visual. And this will work for people trying to save their job. And I'm working with a veteran right now (laughs) that no, we did this assessment on her and we're probably going to try and go in and do a job save for her, which is my background of rehabilitation counseling and rehabilitation psychology, uh, which is getting the proper accommodations in place to support her and her work and employment. And the same thing I write 
letters for parents for, to the schools to identify the accommodations. There's information in the book also about IEPs and 504s that I had a parent write me thanking me for that because they didn't even know that was a possibility that they could advocate for their child. And a lot of parents don't know they can advocate and ask for accommodations in school yeah. for their child. And the child is actually true. federally protected. That's right. But some parents do not know this. Yeah, that's really good. That's a really a good additional piece here. And I'm glad your book covers that piece because I think that's an essential kind of additive here of to say, hey, how can we come alongside our children to allow them to be successful in the way they've got the potential to be so? And how maybe we make some accommodations and modifications to things to really see who who they are and how they can produce. Mm -hmm. So Connie McReynolds, folks, solving the ADHD riddle. It's been great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, for sharing this, and uh, for the work you're doing. It's been great to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I also want to thank you, our listeners, for dropping by and joining Connie me today. It's always great to have you with us. Regarding our episode today, I want to remind you that it and its resources and all of our other episodes can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash bhd. Thanks again for being with us on the show, and we'll look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavior Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.